Welcome to another lecture in our series, November Native American Heritage Month series lectures. And i um, very pleased to welcome you. My name is Chuck Smythe. I'm the director of the Culture and History Department here at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Um, before getting going, I'd like to remind everyone that Sea Alaska has very restrictive parking policies. So if anyone is parked in the lot across the street, you can count on getting booted. So I'd encourage you to, to move your car um, and not leave it there for the hour, because it won't last through the hour. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and um, I forget, there was one other thing. What was it? Um, oh, yeah, please. Um, Watch your cell phones, like in a movie theater, you know, beep, 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 beep. Turn your phones off if you don't mind, it's a reminder. Um, so today I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. John Cloud from Washington, D.C., um, who is an independent historian of cartography. He's a geographer by profession, but has specialized in the history of cartography and uh, worked for at least 12 years for NOAA, National Atmospheric Administration, Nashville Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as a, a historian of cartography. And he's an amazing sleuth, a master detective of archives. I call him the, the master sleuth of archives because he is able to track down and trace interconnections of among multiple archival collections, of which you'll see today. It's, it's really phenomenal. He's been doing this for a long time, but I've seen several of his presentations. And it, even, a, even if you're not interested in following the topic, just his ability to track down things in archives and, and all is really amazing in itself. Um, but we're very happy. He has um, done extensive work on the history of the U.S. Coast and Geogenic Survey in Alaska, and we're going to see the results of that. Um, so his title of his talk today is The Treaty of Session as Seen Through the Lenses of Art, Cartography, and Photography. So Dr. Cloud, we're very, well, very pleased to welcome you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, folks, for coming. There's a lot of uh, faces I've not seen, but other faces of people who are really becoming friends over years and years of coming to Alaska. So, um, um, well, Chuck, I hope I can live up to Chuck's introduction. But uh, so I'm a historian of cartography. And cartography is about dealing with the world say on paper or equivalent and it's supremely important about the the lines that you put on a map and the names you put on a lap on a map and equally important are the names that you don't put on the map so you know that that dance is what I've really been trying to deal with and specifically in that in relationship to Alaska I'd like to honor the many things I learned from Nora and Dick Dauenhauer. And I, you know, I invoke their spirits, you know, for this presentation. So, th this is one of my favorite maps of what became Alaska. It was done in the, about 1980 by uh, a brilliant cartographer of the U.S. Geological Survey, whose name was actually the Greek letters Tau Rho Alpha. And I, you know, I particularly like it because apart from the, the, the geographic grid of lo longitude and latitude occasionally, right, there's no other boundary line shown. So, you know, what is Alaska? What is Canada? What is Siberia? You know, how, how, where do they begin and end? How do you define any differences between them? <coughs> Although, the differences between them all is all fundamental to the whole deal of the Treaty of Session and what happened. And you know, frankly, now that I no longer work for NOAA, that I can say, you know, very openly, the Treaty of Session is all about the Russian-American company pretending to own 
Alaska and then the United States government pretending to buy it. So within this context, the, the Coast Survey, which then became the Coast and Geodetic Survey and is now NOAA, played many, many roles. So another way of dealing with this whole area would be to look at a bunch of names that were not put on the other map and don't generally appear on maps of Alaska of just, you know, the, the people that weren't ever consulted about anything about the Treaty of Session and the present distribution of languages and all that, that you know, everybody here in this room is re really familiar with. So, specifically, I'm going to be talking about three major episodes involving scientists from the Coast Survey who came up to Russian America, then came up to Alaska, and dealt with it in various ways that were fundamental to defining and redefining the boundaries. And in terms of going in chronological order, begins with the harbor of St. Paul on Kodiak Island, and then over to you know, the, the Sitka, and then later on uh, uh, going to Klekwan up the Chilkot River, and then a decade later, two interesting episodes of, of Coast and Geodetic Survey parties that were deep in the interior of Alaska around the approximate boundary line between the, the U.S. and Canada where the Yukon River crosses the boundary and the Porcupine River up above the Arctic Circle. And then a, a side jaunt that they made, the party from the Porcupine River made up to the Arctic Ocean at that time. And then another set of episodes that came down that involved some of the people from all these same places all converging on St. Michael, on the island of St. Michael at a time when St. Michael was for a brief period of some decades one of the most important seaports in the world. So, you know, these are three particular episodes but you can see, I mean, it's just like this amazing range of space along the coast and deep in the interior that, that were involved in this thing. So the hero of a lot of my story all the way along and what I've learned in 12 years is George Davidson. You know, he was a great man uh, to me. He ran the Coast Survey on the West Coast from 1850 when he first arrived. So how did the Coast Survey get to the West Coast? The Coast Survey, and now NOAA, is a profoundly civilian agency, but they have been greatly impacted by every single war the United States has ever fought. So the Mexican War gave a major chunk of, of the southwestern part of what's now the United States from Spain, Mexico, to the United States, and that included California, which meant that the Coast Survey inherited the Pacific Ocean as a place to map the shore of. So in 1850, George Davidson and company came, uh, you know, came up the Pacific. They went, they went across the Atlantic and Caribbean overland in Panama, then another set of ships around up to San Francisco Bay to initiate the work of the Coast Survey. And Davidson stayed based in San Francisco and worked for almost half a century as head of the Coast Survey. So. This is the literal ground zero. This is the very beginning of the Coast Survey mapping of what became Alaska. In 1867, Davidson was given the assignment to go up to New Archangel, or Sitka, still the capital of Russian American Company, to check out this crazy deal about buying the property of the Russian American Company that they purported to own. So he came up in a, a, a U.S. Navy steamship and they stopped first at the harbor of St. Paul on Kodiak Island. And there he did this T sheet, the original manuscript map, T for topography. And he, he was there just a little bit of time, but he sketched in as much as he could learn and as he could map of that environment as he could as he went along. So looking more closely at it, if you want to know anything about the fundamental nature of the Coast Survey, the major thing was wherever they got anywhere, the first thing they did was they made a triangulation network. 
because geopositioning, the exact position of specific spots relative to the triangulation network was the key to everything. So that you can see that that particular station, Station Bush, which might have been an otherwise fairly obscure place out on a rocky little head, headland of an island in the bay, it was actually a very fundamental place because it was central to all these other places with that they could triangulate. And then, once they had the triangulation network, they could start sketching out boundaries of islands and they could put in symbols that represented buildings and phrases, sawmill, you know, wooded, island, etc., that kind of thing. So this was T for topography, with red lines indicating contours to show the third dimension, height above, the mean uh, high water level. So they mapped topography uh, basically from the beginning of dry land. At the same time, they also had ships, little, little sailboats with people with a lead line on a rope that would go out and follow lines there in the water. And at the specific spot, the number represented the depth of the water in fathoms at the time. So this was an H sheet, like an H for hydrography. Normally, they would have T sheets and H sheets that were unified by the fact that the same stations right along the shore were the same ones that were used for both types of maps. But in this case, this was a reconnaissance map. George and company were only there for a few days, so they put all this stuff, H and T, on the same map. But if you, you, if you kind of get that as a system, triangulation network, topography, hydrography, then you've got the essence of what the Coast Survey uh, did for over two centuries. All those T sheets and H sheets were archived by number starting in 1834, T1, T2, T3. And they ended up in the National Archives and it was driving us crazy because we could not get access and Cartographic and Architectural Records Division of National Archives II in College Park, Maryland, to our legacy maps. So it took us two years to talk our way into the National Archives because nothing leaves the National Archives. So we came in with a million dollar scanning environment in 2007 and 2008, and we scanned many, many, many thousands of maps. And the one thing I'm very happy and proud about NOAA, I've, you know, I had an up and down relationship with them, but they let me run that project and I got to pick the maps. And all I knew for Alaska, I wanted maps from the Atlantic and the Pacific and Hawaii and all these places, you know, just a sampling of historic maps. And all I knew about Alaska was here's these very early maps from Alaska, 1867, 1869, and here's some numbers. And they're, because they're put by numbers. So there was in the 2000s, and I went, well, I want, let, me, let me look at that map. And by, for preservation's sake, they're in these big folders, and they're all done like 10 to a folder, and they're, they're always kept upside down because it's easier on the, 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 the original map, the ink lines and all that kind of stuff. So if you get the 10 maps, you go, reveal, reveal, <laughs> reveal. And I flipped this one over, and I went, this does not look like George Davidson, you know. What is this thing? I knew nothing about it. So scan this. So this is the tracing cloth version of what has become known as the Ku Klux map. Davidson knew this one Clinket leader at Klukwan by the name of Ku Klux. Everybody else in the whole world has known him as Shot Ridge. But Shot Ridge and his two wives did this as, uh, as the final one of a series of maps for Davidson in 1869. At the same time, there were other maps very early on from uh, around the time of the Klondike Gold Rush. And same thing, there was a series of numbers. So I said, well, let's go get those numbers, take a look at them. And these maps were also very different from anything like I had seen about Kodiak Island. There were five of them. It's hard to do justice to this map because of the nature of um, PowerPoint. This map is about 700 miles, running miles of the Yukon River. It's over 10 feet long. It was done in pencil, out of his head, 
by a working class in Yupiat, in Yupiat Eskimo named Joe Kukaryuk, 1898. There's a total of these five maps. So the Ko Klux Shot Ridge map and the Joe Kukaryuk maps were unlike anything else that I, I saw. And I, I started on this journey back in 2007 when I discovered them, me, me discovered them. You know, to, wh what are these maps? Where do they come from? What's this all about? So this is basically what I have learned. If you look more closely at just a little tiny section of Joe's map, for example, um, the, the, to, the, the basic cartography was done by Joe. And then, as in the case with the Hokalik Shot Ridge map, they talked intensely about it. And then place names were written in English language orthography, like Tanana River here, where it comes in to the, the main stem of the Yukon, right here past the ramparts of the Yukon. So there's a, there's a hybrid thing. The basic lines, the map was drawn by Alaska natives, but then the talking about the map was fundamental to the identification of specific place names on it and different features. So in the case of these, these five ladder, ladder maps, this, was the, this is what I found. It's like the only evidence, the only information written down about these maps. Joka Karyuk, and there's, the name has many spellings and many pronunciations. Kakaruks are still major family on Seward Peninsula, but I first started calling the name Joe Kakaryuk because it, that's what it said there, so that's what I'm kind of stuck with in my mind, but you can pronounce it any way you want. So, going back to the Ko Klux Shot Ridge map, <clears throat> it was done in ink on tracing cloth, placed over the original map that was pencil on paper. That map is now in the Bancroft Library at University of California at Berkeley. So you get a combination of clinket names in English language orthography as best as George Davidson could put them down, and occasional English comments, starting point for journey to the Yukon. That was the starting point of Shotridge, of a particular journey he did over the Fort Selkirk in 1852 in a, a, a raiding party organized by his father to burn down the Hudson Bay Company trading post at Fort Selkirk. This was also my starting point too, because trying to figure out where these maps came from and what they were about is what got me to Alaska for the very first time in 2010 and subsequent trips. So, we're alternating back and forth here a little bit between George Davidson in the beginning and then later on during the Klondike. So, in 1867, Davidson came up to New Archangel, or Sitka, and received a whole set of, of now extremely historic Russian maps that were fundamental to the whole deal. The Russian-American company was saying, here, we're selling you this whole thing. Well, what is this whole thing? Well, here's the maps. That's fundamental to the identity of this inventing this thing called Alaska. When Davidson came back, the Coast Survey the next year published this map of the harbor and bay and around, uh, islands around Sitka. That's way more work than Davidson could have done in the short time he was there. He was given Russian maps of the harbor that, based on work that went back many decades, that then was properly credited there in the legend and then you know, redone as a coast survey map. When, when Davidson was there in 1867, he did a series of sketches that turned into some chromolithographs of New Archangel or Sitka as, it, as he found it. And there's two of them from the East Harbor and the West Harbor. So here's the major Russian enclave and the Russian church and the bishop's house and all that stuff. Here is how a derivative version of that was published in Harper's Weekly about here's this, our new possession, right? Is, there, is, is this whole thing of, the, uh, of Alaska is being invented. Here's the other view. So it's got a major part of the Russian thing there. And then there's a palisade fence for the Russians to defend themselves against the Clinket. One thing about 
a view or a map. You can't map what you don't see. And Davidson could see the Russian buildings, but he could see all the clan houses of Kaguantan quite clearly. And he drew them as such. So, you know, this, you know, this, is, just, uh, this is foundational, I think. And they are more specifically zeroing in on that. So, he comes back in 1867 at the end of his journey, and the Coast Survey is paid by the U.S. State Department to do this very first edition map of Northwestern America. It was just in the process of, I mean, it isn't even officially Alaska yet. It's Northwestern America, Russian America. Davidson, in 1867, the only place on the mainland of North America that he went was he went up the Lynn Canal, up to the mouth of the Chilcot River, because he wanted to meet a major Clinket leader named Koklux, or Shot Ridge. And the reason he did that was because he wanted to come back in two years, in 1869, because there was going to be a total eclipse of the sun. And it was going to be an all-American total eclipse of the sun in August, the same way as we just had last August, you know, in North America. So this is its path across, you know, very similar, uh, actually very, very, very similar to the August 2017 eclipse. But here's the extension, and then it goes into Canada, so that didn't count. But then here is the pathway up Lynn Canal and so on. So it was going to be pretty close to totality up the Chilcot River. So that's where Davidson wanted to come. So in 1869, he comes back. He requests that the U.S. military that now has substituted for the Russian Imperial Guards to go to Tlaquan and have Shotridge come to Sitka to meet up and they're going to go together. They interpret the order to, the, to go arrest Shotridge, which they do and there's great haste and discontent and various of his retinue get shot and one man gets killed. And so when Davidson shows up, Shotridge is in jail in Sitka. So Davidson gets him out of jail, but while they're there in Sitka, Shotridge by himself makes an initial map of what was of great interest to the Clinket and also to the Americans. What was this vast area on the other side of the coastal mountains, if you go up and over past the glaciers and down into the tributaries of this vast river system of the Yukon, the, about which the white people knew almost nothing. So this is a map of about 500 miles of geography that Shot Ridge did in Sitka. Then they go up to Plaquan. And these are Davidson's colored pencil sketches of the roof pillars in the famous whale house that, as he found it in 1869. Then the eclipse happens, and it's suitably amazing all the way around. And then in the aftermath of that, there's this amazing exchange that happens. So on the Coast Survey part, they take 12 different sheets of drawing paper, not just one, and they glue them together with paper tape. They turn the whole thing over, they, they glue it down to linen, and then they stitch a, a, a silk ribbon around it there. And then they turn that over again and they say, now, could Shotridge and his wives, can you draw the map? The same, that same 500 miles of geography. So this is the map that they did, where over on the right is the Lynn Canal and so on, going up and over the mountains and then into the, all these tributaries that are draining down into the Yukon River. That first map started smearing within a few days because it was in pencil. So Davidson said, how about we put a piece of tracing cloth over that map and we pick up the pencil lines in ink and we redo it and we talk about the map some more and we re-annotate the map. And in that process, about four or five of the 104 place names on the map changed, which I interpret as they do, mm, that name is not quite right. It's actually this name because it's days later. So this is the new and improved version. This came back to Washington shortly after this whole event and was never seen again in Alaska and went it buried in the archives. And nobody, you know, it just disappeared from history until 2007 when I stumbled upon it and scanned it. 
So I've been following this trail ever since. The other part of that exchange was the Clinket gave an old Chilcot blanket pattern board to Davidson. The adged cedar plank only used on one side for the pattern. He turned it over to the blank side and he did an oil painting of the corona of the sun at the height of totality during the total eclipse. And then they do this intellectual potlatch and they exchange the maps for the painting. So, then Davidson comes back in 1869 and the Coast Survey does its second version two years later on a different map projection that, you know, this is Alaska and adjoining territory. If you look at the first version of the map that was done in 1867, here's the Lynn Canal, here's the Chilcot River. That's what they knew of the geography of the place as of 1867. If you look at that same area two years later, 1869, on the second edition of the map, Indian Village, Indian Village, Indian Village, etc. This is Shot Ridge's geography, Shot Ridge and his wives, incorporated into the Coast Survey. Davidson never went beyond right there. So all of this was from the Coclux Shot Ridge map. So at this point, I mean, this means little to Noah, but I said, all right, Noah, that means that Shot Ridge and his wives were members of the Coast and Geodetic Survey. I mean, you know, it's just like flat out. I mean, they published their stuff, so what are you going to do? Yeah, and there's the comparison. So, now we've got Alaska, as Alaska, 1869, and so on. And there's various other people in the Coast Survey who are integral to the whole story. <coughs> and another one of them, it's one of my favorites, is William Dahl here. He became a member of the Coast Survey, Coast and Geodetic Survey. This is actual, his, his actual personnel file photograph done in about 1878. But William Dahl got to Alaska earlier than the invention of the place because he was a member of the Western, Tele Western Union Telegraph Expedition, which was this crazy scheme of the Western Union Telegraph Company to have a telegraph cable that was going to go all the way across the Canadian tundra and Alaska and then go underneath the Bering Sea and then across Siberia and over to Europe. And in 1865 to 1867, so it was an early prelude to the purchase of Russian and America. And it all fell apart when the Atlantic telegraph cable got completed and made the whole project pointless. But they had a scientific division and they had a marine division, the head of which was Captain Scammon. And he's got a cape named for him in Alaska and he's got a lagoon named for him in Baja, California. And this is his personal copy of a chromolithograph of all the incredible flags that they had as part of this whole thing. Everybody's favorite are all the Western Union telegraph flags with all the lightning bolts. But this was collaboration between the United States and Russia, you know, straight off, preceding the sale. So <clears throat> in 1870, William Dahl, now about to join the Coast Survey, published, published Alaska and its resources, which has been called the, the first important book about Alaska that wasn't written in Russian. <clears throat> There's various illustrations in the book that are all based on drawings done by Henry Elliott, who was also associated with the Coast Survey, major protector of fur seals in the Pribilof Islands, etc. This is St. Michael, the Russian enclave before the sale, Russian America. That's Henry Elliott sketching himself sitting next to William Dahl. They're looking at the Russian enclave, the Orthodox Church, the, the, the Redoute, you know, the blockade house, the whole nine yards. So, in 1875, I think it was, John Wesley Powell, who became this major kind of father of American anthropology and Indian studies, <clears throat> he published this map of 
the uh, native tribes of Alaska and adjoining regions. What it really means by native tribes is he's talking about the distribution of language families here. But it was published by John Wesley Powell, but it was done by William Dahl and George David and the, and the, the, the assistance of Assistant Davidson himself. So this was the Coast Survey's view of the language families of Alaska as published by John Wesley Powell. So a lot of things culminated in terms of verbal stuff about the Coast Survey in 1887 when the superintendent, uh, Frederick Thorne, of the Coast and Geodetic Survey issued this set of instructions and memoranda for descriptive reports to accompany original sheets. Original sheets means those unpublished manuscript maps, the T sheets, the H sheets. And it's an amazing thing. It's about a six-page document, and it basically comes down to notice everything. Pay particular attention to subtle things, but get all the obvious things too, and talk to people and get all the names. And special attention is called to the nomenclature of all points named, especially Indians' names. And I think this is really a high point in various ways amongst many low points of the federal government's understanding of natives anywhere in its territory, particularly if you consider what other elements of the U.S. government were doing to natives all over the place in 1887. So now we've got Alaska with all these boundaries that were defined verbally based on vetus bearing. 250 years ago, more than that, in 1741. So there were these ukases between the United States and Imperial Russia in 1824 or 25, and there was another one between the Tsar and the King of Great Britain in the next year that is, so tightened up what was actually the, the boundary lines. But these were defined on paper. So the Coast Survey, because the nature of what they are, they were tasked to tighten up those things to actually determine on the ground the specific boundaries, which brings the Coast Survey back to Alaska for a couple of very significant episodes of stuff. And specifically, well, let's go back to that thing. This is a Russian postage stamp. It's very accurate. Here is Vitus Bering, Danish guy sailing for the Tsar. He's 30 or 40 miles offshore from Mount St. Elias saying, everything I see, I claim for the czar of Imperial Russia. <clears throat> but you know, we got to divide things up between the king and the czar. So that really big mountain, which I'm naming Mount St. Elias, the, the clo we're white people. So the closest whole line of longitude that's closest to the mountain, that nine running north to the frozen ocean that's going to be the boundary between our stuff on the west and the king's stuff on the east. So, you know, 200 years later, it was, you know, or 150 years later, whatever, the, you know, the Coast Survey was told, okay, now, you know, figure out this thing. So this is William Dahl's sketch from much closer offshore of Mount St. Elias, as you saw it in the 1870s. And this is the way it was published in the Coast Survey you know, just cleaned up a little bit. I mean, the, the, the graphic skill of these people in this era to me is just amazing. And also the graphic skill of the people, of the German immigrant <coughs> technicians in Washington <coughs> who rendered the drawings into lithographs and engravings is just incredible. <coughs> in the late 1880s, the, the great, great Britain, which owned Canada, of course, and the United States decided, well, we got to get more specific about that 141 degree line. And, you know, if you, you know, the longitude has to do with time and astronomical positioning. So the British and the Americans go, okay, let's have the British have one party and they'll determine 141 degrees. And the Americans will have another party and we'll take a look at the differences. And if the difference isn't that much, we'll just split the difference. So the British party was done by this great Canadian scientist named William Ogilvy, who was a geologist, astronomer, explorer, very interesting guy. 
I've, I've been in his mountain range and I've drunk water out of his river and I just have a lot of respect for him. <clears throat> this is interesting. He's, he's setting off to get to the Yukon River, go down the Pele, it's a tributary of the Yukon, go down to the main stem of the Yukon in 1887. This is the very first time in this whole story that photography enters the story. And, it's, and the impact of photography becomes um, just amazing and pervasive in ways that because it became pervasive, it's kind of hard for us to disentangle in history, but it's very important to do it. <clears throat> Ogilvy was an early specialist in landscape level photography, like this. This little kind of spruce tree thingy there is the actual invisible boundary line, as he determined it, of you know, 141 degrees as the Yukon River comes around it and does this bend. This is a drawing that was done, published in the United States, based on his photograph, which, you know, you can see it made a little bit more visible. And I love this thing because back then and to this day, if you want to Alaskify or Yukonify any kind of image, you put icic icicles on it, right? I mean, that makes it Alaska. So, Ogilvy Observatory was set up right around there on the main stem of the Yukon. The Americans set up two camps and they overwinter for two years each. The first one is at Camp Davidson, named for George Davidson on the Yukon. The other one was up on, above the Arctic Circle on the Porcupine River, named for um, Benjamin Colonna, who was a well-beloved second in the command of the Coast Survey, who had been injured, um, not fatally, but he'd been crippled uh, during field work, so he could no longer do field work, so he ran everything in the office. So I'm going to talk about the Yukon River group first. So they go up the Yukon River in a steamboat, and steamboats are now a fundamentally major part of the story. And they get, this is the T-sheet that they did about here's the Yukon River, here's their determination of the boundary line, here is Ogilvy's determination right there between this boundary marker and that, so you can see they're very close. So they literally they just, they split the difference. They just made this average line in between, and that's the, that's the boundary between Alaska and Canada. If you look up river, you can see Camp Davidson, Astronomical Observatory. Now, I flipped that map to be from the perspective of if we're in a steamboat and we're coming up the river and it's making a bend to the right, and there's this kind of a sandbar elevated island thing right there on, on that bend. This is a painting that's over there a couple of blocks at the APK done by Guy Kukaryuk. This is clearly labeled as Camp Davidson. There's the steamboat going around to the right. There's the sandbar island. Barely visible right there is the American flag of the actual Camp Davidson. The map and the painting corroborate each other enough that to me, it, it means that not only were the, were, there was the people there from the Coast Survey, but that Guy Kukaryuk was there too. That's the only way he could have done this. It took me years, actually, once I discovered this, to go, oh, Jack, Guy Kukaryuk, Joe Kukaryuk. Whoa, what a coincidence. So, the, the, the people on the Yukon River were, like Ogilvy, getting into photography. And they did a whole bunch of photographs with annotations on them. They faithfully sent hundreds and hundreds of these photographs back to George Davidson in San Francisco, who kept them his entire life. And then after he died, his daughter Eleanor gave many, many hundreds of them the year after he died to the California Academy of Sciences, which went, thank you very much. They put them in boxes, they shoved them under a staircase, and they never looked at them again until two years ago when I called up the California Academy of Sciences and I said, do you have any George Davidson stuff? And Yolanda Bustos, bless her soul, she goes, well, 
there are, there are all these boxes that were under the staircase. So we, I could open the boxes, we can see. So these photographs that came to George Davidson are pretty rich in ethnographic detail. Yeah, this is McQueston, the famous trader. McQueston's camp at 40 Mile Creek, where it comes into Yukon. Mayo here, Al Mayo, he's got a town. Mayo, what? Yep. yep. Who's my great grandfather? Wow. May I have a picture of them? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, guess what? Would you, it, just go, it just goes on. There's your grandmother or something. This, you know, right? So and I, I love these things because this is in this area. This is a decade later. All of this stuff, like 100,000 crazy gold-crazed men are all over this place. It's the Klondike Gold Rush. And you do not associate the Yukon with families at that, in that period. But you know, th this, you know, this is this other Yukon that preceded the gold rush. And, it's, you know, and everything since the gold rush is all trying to get back in some way, back to some sort of stable state after that craziness. <clears throat> but to me, th you know, this is the, just another episode of the multicultural society that Alaska has been developing as for a very long time. So this is a photograph of that trading post at 40 Mile Creek of McQueston and so on, as seen in wintertime in 1891 when you know, the Yukon is a highway because it's all frozen over so you just get the dogs and you come and go on the river. You can, go easily, you can easily go up river. Harder to do that in the summertime because the river is going against you. This is the second painting in the APK by Guy Kukaryuk of that same camp. And if you look there, see, elevated bench above the river, and you notice this mountain coming in on the right. There's the mountain coming in on the right, elevated bench, same came. He had to have been there. So from the evidence of the paintings, there was an association of Guy Kukaryuk with the Coast Survey dating from at least 1890 in the summertime when the steamboats were running. <clears throat> but then the, the ice broke up and that crew went down, uh, you know, was about to get ready to go back down the Yukon River. But right around that time, along came part of a major expedition bankrolled by Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. The major person on which was Edward Glave, who's now remembered particularly as a very sympathetic person to Alaskan and Yukon natives who took great pains about place names on the maps that he did. <clears throat> and my, my, my friends at the Yukon Native Language Center have done quite a bit about this. There was another per they split up at, at one point and half the crew came down the Yukon River on this raft. The person who's most remembered from that was a Klinkit guy, Yanda Yak, right, who had been an earlier guide for uh, Lieutenant Schwatka, Frederick Schwatka. Uh, well, all right, going back to that, from that expedition, here is early on, this is Edward Glaive's drawing on, uh, that turned into uh, a beautiful engraving in Frank uh, Leslie's Weekly, like the flotilla of boats on the Chilcot River. Yeah. So on an earlier expedition, Jan de Jak had been the guide for Lieutenant Frederick Schwatka, who w was sympathetic to Indians, but he also was kind of a pompous guy who really loved to get medals for discovering places where various other people had been living for a very long time. And so when, when they get down to the bottom of the Yukon River in 1880, I think it was, <coughs> Lieutenant Schwatka refused to pay Yandiyak. Yandiyak. What? Say it again. Yandiyak. Yandiyak. Okay. He refused to pay him what he had promised to pay. So the Klingit, you know, pointed his finger at him and said, you will soon die and I am going to take your name and I'll use it the rest of my life. So he became Schwatka. So. So now that other camp, as all that stuff was there on the Yukon River. There's also the other camp up here. 
at Camp Kelowna that was up on, on the Porcupine River. And you know, just looking at it in terms of topography, some major distinctions, much lower hills, than, more like hills than mountains, and way further north, way much more like towards the Arctic. And they also were, you know, photography was becoming a really big thing. This is Camp Kelowna on a bend of the Porcupine River as photographed from one of these hills adjacent looking down on it. And here's the magnetic observatory of Camp Kelowna. And before Yolanda Bustos opened the boxes and we looked at these photographs that no human had seen for more than a century, I'd had some idea that at Camp Kelowna they must have been like living in caves or something like it was, you know, like just like a hardship camp. But actually they had some pretty substantial quarters. They, they were supremely talented scientists who could do lots of hard physical work really fast. So they built a lot of buildings and they, you know, they, they were living life well in a certain sense. This is their T sheet, T for topography, of Camp Kelowna. So you can see the bend in the river. The camp is right, the buildings are right there. And here's the topography of the adjacent hills and so on. And you see the two names. Like they, they were there for almost three years and they learned quite a bit of Gwich'in. So the Porcupine River, the, the Cho'in Jack. Now, if we look a little closer more, there's the camp on the ravine. Here's the freshwater river that, the, you know, right adjacent where they got their good drinking water and where the, you know, where the salmon ran and so on. This low island, kind of a joke, Edmonds Island, that was named for Harry Marcus Weston Edmonds, who's now going to become a, a factor in this story. If we turn that map around, so now we're up here on a terrace, and we're looking down at that direction at the camp. Here's the bend of the river, there's the freshwater stream, etc. Here's a really steep sort of pyramid-shaped mountain on the other side. If you sort of grok that, you compare it to this sepia painting by Guy Kukaryuk, that's one of two Guy Kukaryuk sepia paintings that's in the Anchorage Museum in Anchorage. There's the camp. There's the freshwater river. Here's the bend of the porcupine. There's the pyramid-shaped mountain over on the other side. So when I saw this, I went, Guy Kukaryuk, he had to be there too. I mean, is it, you know, here's the map. Here's the painting. If they corroborate completely, that's meaningful. The one corroborates the other, right? Well, but it, again, back to all these photographs that Yolanda and I were looking at. And one of the photographs was this. And I look at the photograph and I go, wait a minute, deja vu. This looks familiar. And I go, oh my god. I mean, OK, so he wasn't there. <laughs> well, he, he, but he had access to the photograph. Well, how did he get the photograph? Well, this is, again, you know, how, how, just how the thing goes. So, again, so the story goes on of all, you know, all these, this story that is told in the photographs. And I'm starting to see if you put them together, and there's a total of, at California Academy of Sciences, 777 prints like this on cards with various levels of annotation. So at one point, at the end of their time, they'd done all the positioning. Uh, the, it, was, it was March of, 1891, they couldn't see any more stars, so they couldn't do any more observation, but the ice wasn't going to break up for another three months. So they go, oh, well, let's just take a side trip up to the Arctic Ocean. So here's them as they set out to go to the Arctic. And I, you know, if you start to look at these things, after a while, I can see they're putting together a narrative, only the cards were all mixed up, and it, you, it takes a while to do it. But this is they're on their way to the Arctic, and if you take a look at this particular black spruce, which is now that right there, so they're showing the projection. They're going towards the Arctic. And eventually, 
they get to the shore of the Arctic Ocean. And this is Camp Driftwood. And that white in the background, that's the frozen ocean. And apparently, these were the first or among the very first white men to get up to the Arctic Ocean in the winter from the middle of the continent. You know, so they go there and they're like, well, that's great. Okay, let's turn around and go back, <laughs> right? A signal achievement in a certain sense, but they knew exactly how to get there because the winter before, a visitor from the Arctic, uh, from the Arctic coast had come down and they talked and he told them the best route to take and what you do if this, you know, if this was snowed in and go over that way kind of thing. So the photographs reveal much more of a social context for what actually happened. Very little of which shows up in the reports, which are sort of official about, well, we did this, and then we did that, and then we ran out of money, and, you know, and we, you know, then we came home. So then the ice broke up on the Porcupine River again, and so they all get on down, and they go, and this is where the Porcupine comes into the Yukon, and then from there, they was going to make their way down the Yukon. And then both parties ended up going down the Yukon and around to St. Michael, back because it was the gateway to the Yukon. Because the Yukon River, especially in the Delta, is really shallow. You know, the Bering Sea is an arm of the Pacific Ocean. So ocean-going craft would come to St. Michael and then offload cargo onto flat-bottom paddle-wheel steamboats, like the one you've seen in Geico Karik's paintings, that could then go around go up one of the tributaries of the Yukon and go up the Yukon River. When that first group from Camp Porcupine arrived, they were one week late for the revenue cutter, the bear, the famous bear that was leaving the Bering Sea because it was going to ice in for the season. So they had to overwinter at St. Michael. Then the next year, the other party from the Yukon River comes, uh, comes in and the party is still there because you know everybody has to wait till the end of the summer for the bear to go. So significantly, the first party that came down, they didn't overwinter at the Russian enclave. They overwintered at Tachek, the ancient place. It's about a quarter mile away, and they really immersed themselves in in Yupiat, and they learned a lot of tales that, and they worked on ethnographic monographs, what you would call them about that. So the parties come in 1890, 1891 to St. Michael, which is starting to look very different from the way it had been when William Dahl had seen it in the 1860s. And they take this particular photograph of one of those Yukon River steamships there at the commercial enclave that's developing. But there is also a series of extraordinary colored image notebooks done by Guy Kukaryuk that ended up in the possession of Sheldon Jackson, who did all kinds of things, good and bad, in Alaska history, that are now in the Nath National Anthropological Archives in Washington. Well, they're out in, in the pod, or in the National Anthropological Archives in Suitland, Maryland. And this is Guy Kukaryuk's sketch of St. Michael at about that time from the same vantage point. And I'm starting to see there's more and more of these connections. And the key things about it are the fact that the sketch and the photograph are related, but they're not the same. They're, they are trying to present St. Michael as it was perceived in a specific moment in one case by photography, in the other case by very meticulous drawing. <coughs> well, Guy Kukaryuk also did engraved walrus tusks. This is an unattributed tusk that's 100 yards away from the sketchbooks over in the, the museum archives of the National Museum of the American Indian, which might as well be in a different country from National Museum of Natural History archives in Suitland, Maryland. So I went over there to the curator, and she says, well, uh, you know, yeah, I think you're right at St. Michael, but we don't know who did it. And I showed her that previous sketch, and I said, I think I know who did it. You know, I, th I think it was Guy Kukaryuk. So, and in this 
path, I'm following in the footsteps of Dorothy Jean Ray, who became a major person about uh, Eskimo art. This is one of the sketches in the sketchbooks. This is one of Guy Kukaryuk's engraved tusks. All right, so again, you just, you find any clue that, you know, you know the same place seen in different media tells you something about a bunch of things. So there were, there's the second sepia painting in the Anchorage Museum that, it, that was done by a guy Kukaryuk and clearly attributed to them. And I looked at it and I go, you know, well, okay. Again, it's, now I know it's, got, it's gonna be based on a photograph, but, and it's gotta be St. Michael. And it's gotta be St. Michael in part because there was nothing else going on around that time that was equivalent to this. But also if you look right here, right here, those are, that's a weather vane. Those are meteorological instrument stations. That building there was part of the US government enclave. The, the Army Signal Corps, which became the Weather Bureau, which became the National Weather Service of NOAA, that was their basis. That was where their base. And they had this crazy thing, uh, 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 Edward Nelson, uh, for example, where he worked half time as a weather observer, but the other half of the time he was out collecting for the Smithsonian. So, you know, there's only, you know, you're looking basically at the back side of that enclave. And I kept going, you know, I want to go around the bin there, you know, but it's just a painting. And so what can you do? But then again, there are the 777 photographs of California Academy of Sciences. And they start going around the bend, right? So there's the thing, you go around and they go around the bend a little more. And there's the government headquarters. And there's the very distinctive, there's a caribou rack and a moose rack that, that you know, have, were there for decades, apparently, above those doors. And they meant something in terms of you went to the caribou building or you went to the moose building. And then amongst the photographs, Schwatka there under the moose rack. So the great man himself. Anyway, so at the end of this whole thing, and again, this was all about determining 141 degrees. Everybody gets brand new uniforms. They get literally just cleaned up, barbered, all that stuff. And, and John F. Pratt right here was the head of the team that was going to take them all back down to civilization as we know it, AKA San Francisco. And they're here at the, uh, in front of what became the Indian Creek Park, Indian River Park in Sitka. And that was the first version of this little suspension bridge that was there. And in particular, here's one of them all cleaned up. That's Harry Marcus Weston Edmonds, who had been on the Porcupine River, had that island named for him, etc. So that was 1890 or so, 1891. Then 1893, 1894, Canada, AKA Great Britain, and the United States go, well, we need to work on that whole thing of the panhandle boundary. That also goes back to Vitus bearing, where Vitus goes, okay, I'm not even touching the mainland, but everything I see, everything, all, everything up to the mountains on this side, that's owned by the czar. Everything over there is owned by the king. Well, okay, you have to get a little bit more specific about what that line is. So the Coast and Geodetic Survey comes back to start working on mapping the American perspective on that boundary line. So a team under John F. Pratt, they go back to Klaquan. They know everything about the whole story of Shot Ridge and his wives in the original maps. Shot Ridge is dead by this time, but they talk to all kinds of people who were there for the whole deal. And they take this photograph inside the whale house. And there's many variants of, you know, photographs of different people in the whale house, very dramatic. You've seen, you know, uh, whatever, somebody in Pond Company, all that stuff. But this is a particular copy of that photograph that they sent to George Davidson. And he annotates it, interior of Ku Klux's house, which is not, of course, true. And uh, blah, blah, blah. And I made drawings of the, the pillars back in 1869. So this is the print that George Cabison kept his whole life that's now in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. John F. Pratt's negatives, all 800 of them, are in special collections of the Library of the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. This is my photograph of the glass plate negative that 
was used to make that print. So I showed a version of this to my friend uh, Bob Venezia, who's a major graphic specialist guy, and he goes, that's not good enough. You go, next time you go back there, you set your camera and you, just, you don't do just a JPEG, you, you photograph that thing in dot .raw format, and you give it to me, and I'm going to do a little stuff. So he did a little stuff. So the, you know, the point of this is, it is now possible to, de to see details in 19th century photographs that were not visible to people in the 19th century because of digital processing technology. So again, very specifically, Shotridge was dead by this point, but his son, George Shotridge, is there, and then his grandson, Louis Shotridge, is there. And Louis Shotridge, you know, everybody knows, you know, major ethnographer, worked for the University of Pennsylvania Museum, acquiring a whole bunch of, what, Atu, right? Yeah, over time. So, you know, the Coast Survey was intimately involved in a certain sense with this whole thing. But then the Klondike Gold Rush happened. And then major changes again because the two ways to get to the gold fields are either to go on a variant up the Lynn Canal but the Chilkoot Pass as opposed to the Chilkot route, or to go by ocean around to St. Michael get off the deep draft ship, get in the paddle, reel settle, the paddle wheel steamer, and then go up the river. So the Coast Survey is told, OK, go map the Yukon River Delta and map the Yukon River. So they go to St. Michael. And the very first thing they did in 1898 was they hired Joe Kakaryuk, the stepson of Guy Kakaryuk. So again, I started out, and I was Joe Kakaryuk, an Eskimo native of Fort Clarence. And then there's Guy Kakaryuk. Well, it's a coincidence. You know, a, I mean, no, it's not a coincidence at all. The same crowd who came in 1898 was intimately associated with the previous episodes in the Porcupine River and the Yukon River in it and St. Michael. I'm mapping the 141 degree thing. So they get Joe to make a series of maps party of J.F. Pratt. This map was made that by this native without cooperation or suggestion. The names were uh, added at, from his dictation. So that same process as with Davidson. So Eskimo native of, of Port Clarence. Here's Port Clarence there at the, on uh, Seward Peninsula. You know, and I've been there, and this is incredibly accurate. Here's Grantley Harbor. There's Taksuk, and then into the saline basin, it's now called Imarut. And then up the river there is the first major important village right there. An important village was a circle with a dot in the middle. And it turns out that that's a way to mark places that has a lot of salience along the shores of the Bering Sea for a very long time. And still does. You know, there's many names for it in Yupik and in Yupiat. But you know, the, one of them, you know, one way to translate it is the eye of awareness. This is part of a wellness project, for the Indian health project out of Bethel. So John F. Pratt was a very capable person. And amongst other things, he invented a bunch of things. And one of them was he designed a hybrid steamboat that was flat bottomed, shallow draft, so it could go on the Yukon. But it also had a hull design and a screw propeller so it could go on the Bering Sea. It got built in upstate New York, taken apart in sections, put on railroad cars, sent over to Seattle, put on ship, taken up to St. Michael in 1898, and then reassembled on the shores of St. Michael very, very rapidly, because they'd already built the boat. So it was a nine days wonder. And all kinds of people showed up for the reconstruction of the boat. And Amongst other things, there was this one guy who kept showing up in a lot of the photographs. And he didn't look like a white guy, but he didn't look like a native either. And he was wearing a turtleneck sweater and you know, kind of a beret thing. All right. And then he shows up again when they build the boat, and he's up on the deck. OK. 
the person whose name, besides John F. Pratt, about the guy who did the, the place names at his dictation was George R. Putnam. George R. Putnam became, was a major scientist at the Coast Survey, later on uh, founding director of the Lighthouse Service. He did various things. He had accumulated two major photo albums that somehow ended up in the Dartmouth College Library, Special Collections, in New Hampshire. So he's going to show up in the story. And he also wrote a memoir called Sentinel of the Coast that had some photographs about what he had done, and especially here he is on the Yukon Delta, and he's inside his observation tent, and so on. So I found out about the photograph albums in, uh, about in January. Uh, yeah, it was in January. I went to Dartmouth and looked at the photographs. And the photographs are particularly interesting because they're prints. They clearly are closely related to the John F. Pratt negatives, only his photographs have annotations below every one. And I looked at this one. Joe and two Eskimo boys, and then parentheses, Joe Kokaryuk. And I about fell over. So that's Joe Kokaryuk. You know, that's the guy. And then, uh, but wait, Joe's wife at home. Wow. And I go, that whole thing, that composition, that allows me to make sense of a partial double negative thing that I found in Seattle. That's Joe's wife at home again. So, the, the, this notebook that's in New Hampshire is now like my Rosetta Stone to these 800 negatives that are in Seattle, Washington, that are all about all the stuff that happened up here, right? So that's how it's gone. And there's a lot of, you know, there's some things going on about it. I think this might be a self-portrait. It's, it's, uh, it's in the mosquito season, that hints the garb there. It's on the tundra at St. Michael and, you know, there in, is the heavy wooden case with the glass plates. That, so again, here's Joe and Guy Kukaryuk who are coming at the landscape in terms of drawing and painting and gray walrus tusks. And here's the Coast Survey who is dealing with them and coming at the very same landscapes in mapping and photography. And they're meeting in the middle and, and things are moving back and forth between them. So. Talk about uh, just t I'm telling Kathy, you know, in both cases, they are trying to do their best to describe as accurately as possible this amazing culture and landscape as they found it in that time. So in this case, back to the sketchbooks, this is Guy Kokaryuk's amazing depiction of a fish trap. Just, you know, just astonishing level of detail. And, and things that were already well, you know, changing very rapidly in terms of harvesting right, for winter meat. And then there are these things you can do. This is from Joe Kukaryuk's map. This is the Anvik River coming into the Yukon. The dotted line is the preferred route of steamships, right, that is, is says in the annotations. And then here are the place names. Here is the circle and dot village that's right across from another little settlement village thing that's right by a ravine. This is Joe Kokaryuk. Totally independent from that, from the sketchbooks, this is Guy Kokaryuk. Here's the Anvik River frozen coming in. There's the circle and dot village. Here's the white settlement. There's the ravine. So again, these things that all corroborate each other as they are describing the same places that is just, you know, this is this amazing project. And then finally, there in Seattle with John F. Pratt's stuff is the carbon copy, back in the days when there were typewriters and, and carbon paper, of this, at that time, unpublished manuscript about Eskimos of, Nor of Norton Sound and the Yukon Delta by Edmonds that was dedicated to John F. Pratt. And that carbon copy manuscript, Pratt kept his entire life and then it ended up along with the negatives in the, the deal. And part of the reason it was dedicated to Pratt is he did 64 photographs. There's 64 pages of photograph prints that are glued on down into the manuscript and then description of, of the ethnographic objects that Edmonds had collected. And there's some interesting things like this men's 
dancing house thing uh, made by an Eskimo. And you'll, you're going to see that again. Edmonds gave his ethnographic collection in 1904, after, immediately after all of this stuff in the Yukon Delta, to what was in the Lowy Museum at UC Berkeley, now the Phoebe Hearst Museum. This is the dancing house. This is taking the roof of the dancing house off. And in the caption for the photograph, it says, the figures are at a different scale from the scale of the dancing house, with one exception. The exception is the person that's in the hole. And that makes me think that the dancing house and the figures were done by different people. Well, who could have done the dancing house? That's Guy Kokaryuk's sketch from one of the sketchbooks of the men's dancing house. So again, all of this is just evident, just little bits of evidence that are all kind of piling up. The one exception to photographs of stuff is the very last image in the book, which is the specimen of an Eskimo painting illustrating dresses of various Eskimo and Indian tribes. And again, it's a very faded print. It's gone very dark. It never had color to begin with because it was a black and white photo. But it's Athabascan interior folks up here, and then coastal Bering Sea coast Eskimos down below. And if you compare Guy Kokaryuk's figures from the sketchbooks to this, the the some of the figures that are there on the photograph of the painting, I think, it, although it's not attributed to Guy Kokaryuk, I think it's pretty clear who did it. My very characteristic uh, Siberian Yupik from St. Lawrence Island. But there's one curious feature to this photograph, and that's in the lower right at the end. My anthropological knowledge allows me to be suspicious that this guy is an Eskimo. Who could this be? I think that Guy Kukaryuk and Edmonds and the whole rest of them were friends. And this was a joke. And the Eskimo was Harry Marcus Weston Edmonds, pictured here 10 years later. All right. And again, who knows, but I just, you know, I'm following clues. That's all you can do. So George R. Putnam's annotated note notebooks ended up in New England in the Ivy League at Dartmouth College. His ethnographic collections ended up in Davenport, Iowa in the Putnam Museum, which was started by his parents. So they no longer do ethnography. They, protect, they keep all their ethnographic collections carefully, but they no longer display them. So I went there. And the, the curator, didn't, she had no idea how many decades ago it had ever been since anybody had looked at these things. But we open up the cabinets and we pull out these amazing things and put them in light again. It just incredible. In The Sentinel on the Coast, Putnam talks about he had noticed that Joe was a really good artist and he did carved engraved all of his dress. So he asked Joe if he could commission him to do two tusks. So he bought two bear tusks, because there's no walruses in Norton Sound. So they all come from Eskimo way, way up you know, in, um, in the Chukchi Sea. So he gave the two tusks to Joe. And then at the end of the big field season, Joe said, OK, here's the tusks. And he says he got on the boat. And only when he was on the boat did he realize that the tusks that he received were not the same tusks that he had given and that Joe had substituted bigger and better tusks, which he took as some sort of, sort of note of friendship. So the two tusks, I mean, I, you know, I called with the people at the Putnam Museum originally, but you, know, you have any ethnographic stuff from you know, George R. Putnam? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have hundreds of objects. You know. uh, there wouldn't have to be any walrus tusks. Would there? Yeah, there's two. I'm coming. You know? So this is a you know, cribbage board. right? Back thing. This is the steamer Yukon. This is another Coast Survey boat called the uh, boat called the Taku, right there. That was, and and right here, N A and T C. The other tusk has a scene on the backside. 
it's winter, like at St. Michael, and there's another settlement thing over across the, the frozen thing. You know, we look at it a little better here. And, you know, I, I knew it had to have something to do with around St. Michael and the gold rush, but I, I didn't, couldn't identify it. But this thing was very distinctive, some sort of like a geological feature, like some volcanic thing or something. And I went, deja vu. That reminds me of the tusk that Susie Jones showed me when I first went to the Anchorage Museum back in 2012. And she showed me this tusk that was clearly attributed to Guy Kakaryuk. And I go, yeah, that's that. And this is a year later. This is 1899. And this place is bigger now. So I dug into it, you know, very more specifically. So at the end of the field season, 1898, Putnam, Edmonds, Ferris, you know, et cetera, they come back and they say, here's the 1897 published chart of St. Michael Bay. Here's all these new things that we found and we mapped. And you need to include these changes in the next revised edition of the map. So there's St. Michael, there's Tatchek, the ancient place. Here's new things here and there, and then new, th new things over on the other side. This one, new thing right here, North American Trading and Transportation Company, NAT and TC, as on the cribbage board. In this other place, Alaska Exploration Company Station. Well, there it is, but whoa, 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 whoa what, what's that thing? Uh, that looks like that kind of weird geological thing. If, what if we turn the map around to the perspective if you were out in St. Michael Bay looking at it and compare it to that? And I go, okay, you know, these are the same place mapped in two different ways by Guy Kokaryuk and the Coast Survey at about the same time only this one a little earlier because it looks different and there's less going on than there. But again, this is this unified effort somehow. And if you look more closely at it, Guy Kukaryuk was just an astonishing artist. I mean, you know, if, you, if that place still existed and you had the, the image of this thing, you would know where to go and how to turn left and what door to knock on and everything. You'd know that place. But there's something curious there up on the hill some evocative shamanic thing, some sky burial of the, you know, of the, of the Eskimo. What can that thing be? Like everything else that Guy Kukaryuk did, as far as I can tell, that was an extremely accurate presentation of a coasting geodetic survey triangulation station marker. It was the very first thing they would do before they did any mapping was they'd make those stations and do the triangulation network. So this whole process, engraved walrus tusks, painted sketches, photographs, maps looking down from above, all converging, all the same. And in this case, you know, I mean, just more than anything else, particularly St. Michael and environments as seen not from land, but from a boat in the water. And not just any boat, that boat, the Yukon. And not just anywhere on that boat, up on the bridge of the boat, right? And I know that Joe Kokaryuk was there, because there he is, on the bridge of the boat. But there's another unattributed, unannotated negative that's there in Seattle. Older guy, more traditionally dressed, up on the bridge. Could this be the step father, Guy Kukaryuk. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever know, but I didn't know I was ever going to find out where, who Joe Kukaryuk was in the photograph of him. But I think that whether this was Guy Kukaryuk or not, that to be on this position and to be photographed was a, was a signal of respect and friendship between the people on the bridge and the people with the camera and that that overarching story that runs through all of these fragments is this convergence of friends that developed with incredible skills, very different skills who are working in different mediums, but they're all working towards the same objective, which is to present 
this new thing called Alaska as it evolves as best they could. And, you know, here's George Davidson from the older generation. Here's Pratt and, and uh, uh, Putnam and so on of the younger generation there, all working again, sort of organized by the central thing that I think, you know, is, is one of the high points of the history of the Coastal Geodetic Survey. And speci more specifically, a convergence that to me involves all these parties doing their best with their own specific versions of the eye of awareness. Thank you.